And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Welcome to 3ABN Australia Homecoming. Welcome to today's program. It's the homecoming of 3AB in Australia 2020 and it's called Preparing for Eternity. Preparing for Eternity involves knowing Jesus and we're going through the book Steps to Christ so that we can know Jesus and be ready for eternity because without knowing Jesus we won't be there. So I'm Rosemary Malkovich, I'm the host for this program. And I welcome the people who are here to watch this and to listen to Pastor Mike Browning. You'll know Pastor Mike from our Let God Speak series. He is our, our main host and the producer for that program. And he does a wonderful job and he's been doing it for many years. He's going to be leading us through Chapter 2 of Steps to Christ, The Sinner's Need of Christ. But in our previous program... We listened to Dr. Sven Erstring, who helped us with Chapter 1, God's Love for Man, and he sum summarised it this way. One, people are engineered for a type of love that cannot ultimately be found in this world. Two, God is the greatest being in the universe, and love is his greatest quality. Three, we catch glimpses of God's love in the world around us. Four, the Bible is the record of the history of God's love. And five, the clearest picture that we have of God's love is in the person of Jesus Christ, in his life, death and resurrection. But before we hear Pastor Mike Browning, we have Dr. Kevin and his wife Jennifer, Dr. Kevin Petrie and Jennifer Petrie, and they are going to sing a song for us this day on this program called Hide Me, Lord. storm clouds may gather and the tempests are wild there's not a darkness or a wind that can blow but my heavenly father already Till the storm is past, take me to the shelter of your wings. Hold me, Lord, for the night is nearly o'er. Hide us in the shadow.
Till the storm is past Take me to the shelter of your ways Hold me, Lord For the night is nearly home Hide us in the shadow of your ways Hide us in the shadow Well, thank you, Kevin and Jennifer. That was an absolutely beautiful song, and it was very touching, and I appreciate that. And welcome to those who have come to share with us today. We'd like to invite you to bow with us in prayer as we seek God before we open the Scriptures. So please join us. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God in heaven, for the privilege of being alive today. We're talking about life today and what it means its value and how it can be extended. And I pray that you'll guide us through your Holy Spirit today. Guide the words of this preacher and touch every heart listening, please, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I think we all know, folks, that death is so final. And it can come as a tremendous shock and, it, um, and can turn us right off. Uh, all that we're thinking, um, my dad when he was getting old, um, was getting more frail, as people do, of course. And then um, I got a call. We were living on the Gold Coast, um, which is in Queensland in Australia, and we got the call, um, Dad's failing, you probably should come down. Now, he was living in Sydney, which is about nine hours drive away from us. And I was out at the time, got home, and my wife, Anne, says, had this call. I did ring the airport. There's just two seats left on the last plane tonight. We could get on that or we can drive down in the morning. And I thought, oh, what are we going to do? They were expensive seats, you know, you buy them off the cuff and yes, they're usually pretty dear. And, uh, and anyhow, I wanted my car down there in Sydney. Um, so I said, oh, we've got to pray. We've got to know from God, should we go on this, take these two um, seats on the plane and go or should we drive down in the morning? So we just got on our knees and we prayed and we prayed and we didn't have long to make our decision. And I said, Lord, I know this is unusual and you don't often do this, but I'd like you to speak to me through the Bible. We've got to know now because we've only got a few moments to make our decision. So I said, Lord, please speak to me through the scriptures. And so I opened up the scriptures and I read Psalm 130 and verse six. And I want to read it out to you because it's just amazing what it says. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. And I knew God had spoken. Now, I must hasten to say here that I've, I've sought God for direction through the scriptures like that before, and God has not chosen to do that. So I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea here. But I would like to pose the question, why did God answer that question so directly through the scripture on that occasion? And I think the answer is pretty obvious, folks. Death is a very big deal to us, isn't it? Somebody close to us is passing away, or even if it's us, when the time comes. It's a very important thing, and because of that, it's very important to God as well. And perhaps you've had that experience. I've seen so many people's lives, in their lives, when a death is approaching to someone in the family, God really goes out of his way to help people um, because he, he's very compassionate towards us at such a time because death, dear folks, brings to the end the greatest gift that we have, which is life. And by the way, we took those two plane um, tickets down to Sydney. We got down there um, about nine o'clock in the evening and by one o'clock in the morning, Dad breathed his last. Had we not gone, when we did, I wouldn't have said you know, my goodbyes to him and uh, been able to just communicate with him briefly before he went. So God knew what he was doing. The tenderness of God is just remarkable at such a time as this. Death 
is the cessation of life, and life is our greatest gift. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. And so how important it is. All right, so I'm going to talk more about life today than death, you'll be glad to know. Um, I want to talk about physical life. Now, everybody here at this point in time has physical life or natural life, as the Bible puts it. Saint and sinner, we're all the same. We possess life. That's the thing that God has given us. Um, we are born and we live. At your conception, 200 million would-be humans took to the racetrack. Your little champion got there first and here you are. You're alive and you're enjoying natural life. And that's amazing. Initially, of course, the human race was born a little differently from the way it is today. Adam and Eve, our first parents, were pure and happy and holy in every sense of the word. And I'm going to read to you from Steps to Christ, chapter two, the chapter we're looking at today, because I want to just make clear what, was, what sort of a person Adam, representing each one of us as God in, potentially wanted us to be. And it says this, Adam was perfect in his being and in harmony with God, his thoughts were pure, his aims were holy. Um, so it was, a, it was a beautiful, holy, happy being that God had made. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. And without going into the detail of Adam and Eve's fall and their disobedience to God, I'm just going to read very briefly, still in chapter seven, uh, verse, I'm sorry, page 17 of Steps to Christ. But through disobedience, his, that's Adam's powers, were perverted and selfishness took the place of love, sadly. As a result, it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. And so mankind moved into a very difficult time in their experience, in our experience. Um, sin definitely marred humanity. And one of the worst and most damaging emotions that we can experience, which is fear, was immediately coming into their lives. And amazingly, they were afraid of God. And I thought, well, that's tremendously sad. Not only that, they were denied access to the tree of life, and so therefore they were doomed. There's no other word to describe it. The wages of sin is death, and that's what they faced and ultimately experienced. I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 44, um, which says this, talking about death, it is sown, as in buried, a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So that's the kind of body you have in the resurrection, a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now that's interesting that he makes that difference there. We'll talk about that some more. The next verse 45 says, and so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, reference to Jesus here. Verse 46, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. So you have natural life now, but the spiritual, and he says afterward the spiritual, the spiritual life is what God is going to give us, the spiritual body. A spiritual body, folks, don't think in terms of disembodied spirits floating about without bodies, a spiritual body. Um, and it's quite different. That's really interesting. So how was God going to respond to this? Well, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul, the Apostle Paul, clearly explains what happened, what God did. Verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, the fullness of the time, a reference to Daniel chapter 9, which gives the exact time for the Messiah, the Son of God, to appear on the earth. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So he sent forth his Son to save us from death. We, were, we faced a terrible dilemma. None of us can stop the march toward the grave, can we? Some of us here are further along the way than others, um, but we're all conscious of that fact. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but it's God has a plan, however, to deal with this. And he sent his son. And once again, I'm appealing to the writings of EGW here, Ellen White, in First Selected Messages, page 296. And it makes this statement, in him was life, talking about the nature of Christ now. 
In him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. Original, unborrowed. This is a underived. This is a tremendously profound statement, dear folks. Um, Jesus had life, not just physical life, which he did have, just like we have, and not just immortal life, which is what we are aspiring to. He also possessed life. Now, there's a difference. No other human being has ever or will ever have that power. Only God possesses life and is therefore able to give life. No other human will have that. I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11 there. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. Um, a beautiful statement by, the, by John. 1 John 5, 11. This is what he says. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. That's good to know. And this life is found in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So Jesus is the source of life. And if we come to him, we find the life that we are looking to, looking and aspiring to have. That is immortal life. Remember that. Remember that word. Remember, life was not gifted to Jesus. He possessed life. And that's why we need Jesus, folks. We need him more than anything else. And we may have all that he offers and he's prepared to come into our lives. I'm going to read to you from God, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John understood some of the most profound aspects of Jesus' life and his possession of the life principle. John chapter 5, sorry, chapter 10, verse 17. John 10 and verse 17. Jesus is talking and he says, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now some of you have been quite familiar with this statement. Then this one. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Uh, Jesus lay down his life when he died on the cross, folks. No one, he says, takes it from me. He laid it down willingly. Now, this is amazing. And what an incredible thing to say. So he laid down his physical life. Um, not his divine life, if you like. Um, because... Um, his, in his divine life, he was immortal, which by def definition means not subject to death. And so Jesus' divine life <clears throat> was immortal and, of course, could not be laid down, could not be lost. And this is no wonder, folks, when Jesus came out of the grave, as described in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, he says that he holds the key to death and the grave. And how exciting that is. Dear friends, he is the one that we need. We need him more than we need anything else. No other human being has what Jesus has. And he alone can give it to us. Now, look, here's a profound statement. Once again, it comes from the writings of Ellen G. White. And it's found in the book, Great Controversy, page 652. It's a simple statement. And this is what it, what it says. The mystery of the cross explains every other mystery. Because I've just been talking about a mystery here, haven't I? How the Son of God, in his humanity, could lay down his life, his natural life, and then take it up again. Now, if that's not a mystery to you, um, then you have, you have a spiritual mind that I don't have. It is a huge mystery, folks. And this scripture, this statement, rather, by Lindsay White, that the mystery of the cross, which is what we've just talked about, that mystery explains all other mysteries. What is the mystery that the cross explains? Now, I know I'm only going to touch the surface on such a profound statement, but I'm going to do my best today. In Romans chapter 3 um, and verse 26, Romans 3 verse 26, the Apostle Paul again raises something that's going to help us here. Romans chapter 3 and verse 26 Romans chapter 3 and verse 26, which says, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be, now listen carefully here, that he might be just 
and the justifier of the one who believes in Christ or has faith in Christ. Both just and justifier. He's just in that he met the demands of the broken law of God, the eternal law of God. At the same time, he's able to justify the people who come to him in faith. And as you know, that word justified is a play on, we can use a play on the word just as if I'd never sinned. You are accounted as though you've never sinned if you have been justified. And God is able to do on the cross, be both just and justifier of those who believe. And it's pretty exciting when you think about it, folks, that he is able to do that. Um, it's remarkable, really. I want to just go over to chapter 6 of, of um, Romans as well. This is chapter 6 and verse 8 now where it says, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, this is on the tail end of a statement that begins in verse 6, which I'm now going to read. Still Romans 3, sorry, Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That is our sinful nature, folks, and our sins. We're crucified with him. When Jesus died, we were deemed to have died. This is the mystery of the cross that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. That's clear. And then he goes on to say what we read before, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. It's a very interesting thing. Um, when John was talking or quoting Jesus, talking about his coming death on the cross, in chapter 12 of John and verse 31, Jesus makes this profound statement. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As he faces the cross, he recognises, dear friends, that he is being judged as guilty for the sins of the entire world. And because you are in Christ, then the judgment was placed on you of guilt. You're guilty. There's no question about it. But Jesus, as our representative, was going to pay the price for our guilt. Praise God for that. Then he goes on to say in verse 32 and give us the context. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So it was the cross he was talking about being lifted up on the cross when he said, now is the judgment of this world. So the world, the whole world, every human being, dear friends, was with the exception of himself, the one who paid the price for our sins. Isn't that incredible that he should do that? So what a blessing it is that we have a saviour who was judged as guilty for our sins in order that he might be justifier of those who believe in Christ. Jesus tried to explain the fact that he possessed life to the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the Jewish people. They didn't want to hear it, but he told them anyway. And I'm going to read some of the things that he said to them in chapter 5 of John and verse 21. As the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whoever he wills. The Son gives life, dear friends, to whomever he chooses to give life to. Verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. It's rather encouraging to me, as I'm sure it is to you, to know that the one who gave his life for us and is our Saviour is also our judge. Uh, it go, he goes on to say something more about that, actually. I'm going down to verse 24, still John chapter 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. That's an interesting statement that Jesus is making here. Those who believe in him do not come into judgment. Dear friends, those who trust in Jesus do not stand trembling before the bar of God. They're to give account for their sins. They don't have to do that. We don't have to do that because we were judged as guilty already. So we don't come into judgment and the price has already been paid and we are now justified. And he goes on to say in verse 24, but has passed from death to life. So a huge transition has been made. When we receive Jesus, dear friends, when we accept what he has done on the cross for us, we pass from death to life. 
Death is no longer our destiny as sinners. Life is our destiny. What a brilliant thing God has done in arranging such a wonderful thing. And when we go over to back to the letter of John, 1 John chapter 5, where he spoke quite a lot about this, 1 John chapter 5 and now verse 13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And that would include us all. If we believe in Jesus, this is us, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So you have eternal life at the moment you believe. Your sins have already gone to judgment. The price has been paid for your sins already, and you are now justified. You are now a son or a daughter of God, and heaven is your destiny. Not yet, however. Because you don't have eternal life at the moment. Sorry, you don't have immortal life at the moment. You believe you have eternal life. Now, eternal life can be interrupted by death. And for most of God's people throughout history, that has happened. And death has been the interruption. And the resurrection, of course, we'll deal with that. Um, but we still die, even though we have eternal life. Do we lose eternal life because we die? Of course we do not. Thank the Lord for that. What an arrangement he has made. In the book Maranatha, 302 is the page number. Uh, there's an, a statement I want to read out. It says this, We become one with him, and our will is brought into harmony with the divine will. We become partakers of the life of Christ, which is eternal. You actually become a partaker of his life. Now, how wonderful it is that God has made such an arrangement for us that we are um, thus taken from death as our destiny to life as our experience and, of course, our destiny too. Now, this is a process, dear friends. It's a process that we go through. And I'd like to suggest to you now that um, as we talk about this together, that we realise, dear friends, how important our relationship with Jesus is because our privilege is we may get to know him. Who To know is life eternal. It is our privilege to actually come into communication with him. Jesus made some astounding promises, you know. Um, it's worth just going through and looking at the promises he made, writing them down in a book somewhere so you've got them all together because... He said some things that, well, we need to keep in mind. They're very encouraging, very encouraging indeed. I want to read you one out of, um, let's see, John chapter 14 and verse 21, where Jesus gives us this beautiful promise. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them. Um, in other words, you're faithful, you're loyal. You're a commandment keeper because you're loyal to Jesus. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Right? Obedience was always a demonstration of love to God. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And then this, and manifest myself to him. That word manifest is sometimes translated reveal myself. He will reveal himself to us. Now, I'm going to put it to you that if you rush into his presence first thing in the morning and you spend 30 seconds just giving your life to Christ and moving on with your life, not a bad thing to do, but if that's all you do in terms of your communication with God, you are not going to sense him revealing himself to you. How does God reveal himself to us? How does Jesus manifest himself to us? He said it a lot of times. He manifests himself through the peace that he brings. If you take time in prayer, you will sense his presence through the sense of peace that he brings into your life. Many of us are too busy to experience that privilege, but all of us may. Just take the time and claim this promise and say, Lord, you've promised to reveal yourself, manifest yourself to me. Today, may I have the peace of your presence. And God will do that. And we're encouraged by the little lady to spend time not rushing into his presence and rushing out again, but taking time to wait for counsel. And I believe many more of us would be hearing the, hearing the voice of God if we were to do that in prayer. So prayer is an absolute essential. 
that draws us into the presence of Jesus, gives us confidence in him, confidence that we may um, rest in him for our forgiveness of our sins, not only that, for the hope of eternity. Prayer does something really remarkable. Now, Paul knew about this, the Apostle Paul, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to read you what he said about this, and this is a very profound statement. Um, I don't claim to fully get what he is saying here, um, but I'd like, I'd like to read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Then he says, but we have the mind of Christ. Through prayer, dear friends, we become like him. The Holy Spirit is able to move in our minds and make us like Jesus as we spend time with him. Um, because as we focus on him and as we read this amazing book and as the Holy Spirit impresses things upon our minds, we become like Christ. We have the mind of Christ. You begin to love the things that he loves and to hate the things the world loves and you begin to become like Jesus. And I just think, wow, what a privilege we have that he should do that. We have the mind of Christ. People struggle with temptation. Christians struggle with temptation, don't they? And it can spoil your relationship with Christ. Sin is an enemy, whichever way it comes at you. And temptation is not a happy experience for any of us. Um, but what do we do about it? Does having the mind of Christ help us to deal with temptation to sin? I'm going to suggest that it definitely does. I am going to show you now what I consider to be the most powerful promise in the entire Bible when it comes to making sure you live the life of obedience to Jesus Christ that you want to live. I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Please write it down. Don't forget this. This is going to help you in your walk in, with Christ in life. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is to say, not things of this life, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And then listen to this next verse, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then this point bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, folks, this is where it all happens, in between your ears. Isn't that correct? Right? That's where your relationship with God occurs. Your decisions are made there. That's where you really live your life. And that's where we get tempted. And what does it say? Bring in th every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I'm going to suggest to you that you can't do that on your own and neither can I. And this is where the indwelling Holy Spirit brings the mind of Christ into us, brings Jesus into our lives so that he is able to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So this is what I do. I'll just explain to you briefly how I deal with this. Um, if I'm tempted, and it happens too often, <clears throat> then I pray like this, Lord, <coughs> Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and bring my thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I, he never fails me. It could be many times a day and I, come, and I just become aware an hour or two later that I haven't thought that thought since. So I'm encouraging you folks, take advantage of this. This is a powerful promise and God will never fail you. All the resources of heaven, dear friends, are geared up to help human beings deal with the sin problem. And if you ask for help, you get it. And this promise is the best and most powerful promise I know in order to deal with the problem of sin. It's um, fantastic, really, because on our own, we cannot deal with sin. I'm sure we all know this. I'm going to read to you from Steps to Christ, page 18. This is once again that second chapter that we're looking at at the moment. This is what it says. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere. But here, that is dealing with sin and temptation, here they are powerless. Isn't that true? So it's good to know that. 
That's why God hasn't left us alone, because alone we're doomed. We're done for. We haven't got a hope. But in Jesus, dear friends, it's all under control. Jesus has made every provision for us. If necessary, every angel in heaven would come to our assistance. By the way, I also pray that. And I ask that God will surround me with holy angels and banish the demons. They love to spoil your life and give you and harass you. Don't let them. Ask God to send his angels to protect you and give you a break. Everybody needs a break. And we need breaks from the harassment and temptation that comes in this life. And so please remember that fantastic promise. Because on our own, we can't do a thing about it. But in Christ, we can. What a wonderful thing. All right, to back up, where were we? We have eternal life, but we don't have immortal life. Have you got that? When we believe in Jesus, we are given the gift that says eternal life, but you don't have immortal life yet. None of us have it. We know that, don't we? We wouldn't die if we had immortal life, but you don't get to heaven without immortality. So how is God going to deal with this? Well, I'm going to read to you again from 1 Corinthians 15 because it's such a a wonderful statement that Paul is making here about the, the necessity of immortal life. And so he says in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Notice the connection between corruption here and flesh and blood. Um, Specifically, this is dealing with our sinfulness, our sinful nature, if you like. But not only that, it's dealing with our natural life. Natural life and the sin that we battle within it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can't go there. So even though you have eternal life by faith, the hope of eternal life, dear friends, you don't have immortality. We are not yet fitted for heaven. We are not. What are we going to do about it? Well, the sin infection must go. Um, That's the problem. That sin infection must go. I once talked to a young fellow, young man, about this. And he said to me, oh, he said, I know that. I know we can't go to heaven the way we are. He said, that's why we've got to go to purgatory. You've got to go to purgatory for a time so that the sin is purged out of you in purgatory. And I said to him, well, look, you're on the right track. You can't go to heaven with that sin on your shoulders and that sinful nature, but I've got good news for you. You don't have to go to the flames to have it dealt with, dear friends. We have it dealt with already by Jesus Christ. He was the one who suffered. His his blood was shed. He died on the cross that we wouldn't have to. What a bargain. Why wouldn't you accept Jesus Christ as your saviour? It's the biggest bargain you ever heard in your life. Now, some people love bargains. I've got a friend who loves bargains. And if ever I want anything or need anything to be bought or anything like I talk to him and I say, I would not give his name. Uh, You might all want to talk to him. He might get nothing else done. And I say, do you reckon you could find me thus and thus? And he never forgets. And he always finds it for me. He's amazing. He just loves a bargain. Well, dear friends, most of us, I guess, love a bargain, but you never heard a bargain like this one. You're off scot-free. There's to be no suffering, specifically no suffering. When you come to Jesus, how do you publicly demonstrate the fact that you have accepted Jesus into your life? What do you do? Walk on hot coals? There are some religions who believe you should do that. Um, What about it? Do you flagellate yourself with whips? Is that how you demonstrate that? No, you're baptised. And it's very specifically a gentle experience as you go under those waters. I guess our audience here have all been baptised at some point in time. Was it painful? Did it hurt? Of course it didn't. You can't imagine anything more soft and gentle than just being swamped with water and then you come out of the water. Why is it so easy? It's specifically like that. God wants us to draw the contrast between our baptism in water and the cross and the blood of the cross, which was a terrible experience. What a wonderful thing God has done in making such a provision for us. 
to have life, endless life. I'm so grateful that he does that. So grateful. I should read on here in 1 Corinthians 15. I read verse 50 where it says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we're not quite ready for, it, for heaven yet. Dear friends, we're not. What else is going to happen? Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. The Bible is full of mysteries. Most of them are explained, at least partly. I tell you a mystery, and he's going to tell us the mystery. We shall not all sleep, referring to the sleep of death, of course, but we shall all be changed because we need to be changed. We must be changed. He goes on to say in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Okay, so there's a change comes when the trumpet blasts. And that trumpet, trumpet blasts when Jesus comes the second time. And we know that he comes to gather together his children and call us out of the graves. What's it going to be like? The dead will be raised incorruptible, he says. And we, that is those still alive, the last generation will still be living. We shall be changed. 4 verse 33, 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption. And then what comes next? This mortal must put on immortality. The word must is very significant there. No options here, folks. It must happen because no one goes to glory without becoming immortal first. I like the fact that it's two things happen there. One of them, our corruption is taken away and at the same time we are given immortality. No corruptible, sin-infested person receives immortality and it makes good sense as to why not. But now we do. We receive more immortality, never subject to death. Well, what an amazing offer God makes. An incredible offer. Our natural body is doomed. That's the one we have now. We all know it. But in the resurrection, we have a spiritual, immortal body. What's it going to be like? It's going to be fantastic, folks. We don't, have, we don't know how magnificent it is going to be. We only know and are told that our, we are going to be like him in our resurrection. So as Jesus was in his resurrection, so we will be in ours. Because Jesus still retains his humanity, doesn't he? He is still the God-man, Jesus Christ. So what he experienced in his humanity, we will experience. And I tell you what, it was a, a definitely a new, improved version of humanity that Jesus had after his resurrection. A spiritual, immortal body. And we are going to experience that. With that immortal body, and folks, we are going to transition from earth to heaven because the resurrection takes place right here on earth. And Jesus takes us back to the glory land. And we can look forward to that because that is going to be such a wonderful experience. You're going to be able to go to a place where there's no temptation, where there's no pain and sorrow. And plenty of us have had those sort of experiences that are not pleasant. But it won't happen again, dear friends. And when we get there, we're going to say heaven was cheap enough. Trials of this life will just fade into the distance and be as nothing when we compare them with the beauty of immortality. I'm going to read again from Maranatha chapter page 302, which says this, we derive immortality from God by receiving the life of Christ. That's how you get it, by receiving the life of Christ. And that's where we start right now. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's trying to say to us uh, there, um, that he has the authority to do this. He has the fullness of the Godhead in his human body. He's the fullness of God. So that's, that's the thing that he's trying to say, uh, say to us. Paul summarizes how we are to live now that we have uh, eternal life. And I'm going to just read to you a couple of scriptures. The first one is found in Galatians chapter 2. And verse 20, Galatians 2 and verse 20, 
And Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, I mentioned a moment ago, didn't I? When Christ died, we died. We're deemed to have died. I have been crucified with Christ. We are deemed to have been crucified with him. Dear friends, we are deemed to have paid the full price for our sins and our breaking of God's law when Christ died because we were in Christ. It is no longer, therefore, I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I don't pretend to understand the closeness of the experience that is being described for us here, where he said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's just so profound. We may have an experience with God and Jesus that escapes most of us, but is available to all of us. We may have such an experience and it's our privilege to do that. Crucified with Christ. That is, we've put to death our self and our desire for anything that is not like Christ. And now we want to live for him. Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, this statement, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, and he says this, To them, the saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Here's another mystery being made plain. The riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you have Christ living in you, dear friends, you have his life and you have the promise of immortal life. God couldn't do any more than that for us. We have been so blessed to have this, so blessed that we're able to do that. Back in chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in Jesus, in him it says, but it's talking about Jesus, in him all the fullness should dwell. Folks, he came behind in none of the powers of, divine, of the divine when he walked this earth in his humanity. And when the promise is made to you and to me of life and its immortal life, we may have confidence that it is ours and it is ours to keep. So that's our goal. Lose sight of ourselves, live for Jesus. Lose sight of the world. Folks, we've got to turn our back on the things of the world, particularly the pressures that the world puts on everybody to follow the standards and the behaviour of the world. It's so powerful now, isn't it? I don't know how our young people cope with the television and the constant bombardment um, of basically a sinful lifestyle. It's demonstrated there for everybody to see and it goes on and on and on. And I really fear for our children. Our children need our prayers. Now I'm going to suggest to you that you do something for your children and grandchildren and for yourselves. My wife and I set aside Fridays and we've been doing this for some months now and we have a, a Friday of prayer and fasting. We don't do a complete fast. It's just a simple food fast. And we pray every hour on the hour. So when we're together, we pray together. And if we happen to be off doing something else, um, because we don't stop doing our regular things, we know that every hour on the hour, we're both praying. And I'd encourage you to do that. That didn't come with me. Um, when we were in Tasmania ministering there years ago, um, we had some friends who lived down um, um, south of Hobart who went to Little Glen Hewen Church there and their boys had gone astray. And so they told me, well, we've set aside, I think they set aside Fridays too. We set aside every Friday to fast and pray for our sons. Now I'm telling you, that was, that's a wonderful thing to do. The first boy came to Christ within months, short months. I don't know how the other boy has gone, but I do know this. There's power in that kind of praying. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, every Friday, Anne and I will be doing it. We'll be doing it again tomorrow. And we've got a lot of things to pray about. And I guarantee you have two people. Put them to God in prayer. Pray for yourself. 
Someone said to me, oh, well, I feel a bit selfish praying for myself. Well, I said, well, that's fine as long as everyone knows what your needs are and can pray for you. If, you're not, if not, you better be praying for yourself because you need that, that help yourself. We've got to put aside flirting with sin. Folks, it's a dangerous thing. There's so much to lose. Remember the bargain. You can lose the bargain. Don't do it. The rewards. The rewards of following Christ are sensational, people. Absolutely sensational. I want to read to you a couple of statements and I might make some of the book Great Controversy. Both these statements come from page 675. And this is going to warm your heart, I'm sure. This is what she says. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. Remember I said the rewards are sensational. He just wants your heart now. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. I'm willing to give it a try, but I'd like to know. I want to see it, don't you? I want to be there. You know, what a bargain. The bargain is ours. And, all, and, it's, and it's just as gentle as, as a, a covering of water when you're baptised. No pain, no blood, no purgatory. No, just reach out to Jesus, give him your life. Then she makes this statement. This is page 675, a great controversy still. There are ever flowing streams. Look at this, clear as crystal. And beside them, waving trees cast their shadows upon the paths prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There the widespreading plains swell into hills of beauty. Now, I hope you're getting a mental picture of this. I'd be, I read this often. I keep the book Great Controversy beside my bed and I read it often, especially those last few chapters because they're so exciting and such a wonderful picture of eternity comes to us. Where do we get to? Oh, yes, there the widespreading plains swell into hills of beauty and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. You know, you could end your life in a little caravan on the side of a hill, and it doesn't matter. If that's all you possessed, who cares? Look at this that we've just been reading about, dear friends. It's just so exciting to think about. And I just think, you know, I would love, I've always loved the thought of some beautiful land with lovely soil, because I'm a keen gardener. I have an orchard at home and, and I love to see things grow. The, just the miracle of it just is amazing. And I'd love to have a stream going past my place, wouldn't you? A crystal, crystal clear stream. There's nothing like pure water. I don't know if you've ever tasted pure water. In the mountains of Tasmania, I have tasted pure water um, without any, anything at all to, to pollute it of any kind, not even mud. And it, folks, it has a taste. It has a flavour. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, that's the kind of stream we're going to have there. I won't, you mightn't have it on this, on this earth, but you're going to have it there because God has arranged it for you. So I'm asking you, inviting you to make your commitment to Jesus today. <clears throat> Folks, if you're watching this on television and you know that this is the moment, then don't wait, do it. Now is the time. There will never be a better time to come to Jesus. And I'm going to pray for us now as we close. So would you join with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus is the source and the author of life, that by his amazing death on the cross of Calvary, he purchased life for us. Father, we embrace it again today. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come and fill us and that the blood of Jesus will cover every person who earnestly desires it today. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 